and you know some people come from the artist side and move to the writer side some people transition the other way it, you know in my experience as a publisher and a manager it's a complicated um, dance to, to do for a lot of people and everyone on this panel has navigated that in some way either as you know, one way or the other. So I'm going to jump right in. I always say this at Reboots. We have questions, and obviously this is a panel discussion, but it's really important to me and to, to the team that we get as much kind of inquiry and feedback from you guys as possible. So this isn't a structured, you know, um, one-way conversation. This is really a dialogue. So as, as it goes on, please feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. Um, I don't know if we have mics out there, but, you know, you can just get our attention and really just encourage participation. Um, so I want to start just introducing everybody. It's MDR, amazing artist. Yeah. Becca Tishka, manager, publisher. Yeah. <laughs> Kay Flay. <laughs> Naz Tokyo. Yeah. Claudia Brandt. And my co-founder and co-host for today, Simon Wilcox. Um, so why don't we go down from you okay. and just a little bit about your story. Okay, um, I'm an MNDR and uh, originally was a hired bass player and music director. Um, did that for the Yeah Yeah's It's Blitz tour and played in a lot of different bands and then sort of made the jump to be a producer in 2009. And from that, I was a MySpace artist, and I put some demos on, yeah. That's all. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> MySpace. Um, so I'm like a 1,000 years old right now. So um, OK. So and from that, I went on to work with Mark Ronson and Q-Tip and was had a big record called Bang Bang Bang, I guess big internationally, probably more than here, and then went on to do that, and now I write and produce, and I'm at MNDR, that's it. Um, I'm Becca Tishker, I've been um, a longtime publisher, manager, I've worked for a lot of amazing people, and then a couple years ago, I decided to step out and do my own thing. So, yeah, I manage songwriters, producers, artists, and have a pub venture with Pulse, and it's awesome. Oh. Um, hey guys, I'm Kay Flay Christine. Um, I am a recording artist, and yeah, I guess speaking to Maria, what you said, sort of in the last couple of years, gotten more into writing for other people as well, and um, yeah, have a new record coming out. I don't know, you know, I play shows, stuff like that, so. <laughs> I'm Naz Tokyo, I'm a singer, songwriter, artist. Um, kind of started out because I had a buddy who was like writing for Aaliyah and blowing up um, as an R&B singer named Tank. And he told me I could sing, so I was like, he's like, move to LA, I was like, okay. So I moved to LA and um, wrote with him. My first placements were on his Grammy-nominated album. We lost to Shaka Khan, but that's okay. Uh, I was like, as long as it's a legend. <laughs> and then from there, kind of hopped around, went to work with T.I. and um, had a lot of people that wanted to sign me as an artist, but I, I was like sitting back like, I don't know if I like your business style. Let me see if I, you know. <laughs> so if anything, it was probably me that slowed down the artist process because I was such a, my business brain would kick in too much sometimes. Um, and then transitioned, ended up in L.A. and uh, just signed a deal with Pitbull for a single deal as an artist. So I've had like placements with other people, but now I'm doing my artistry a little bit more. So yeah. Uh, my name is Claudia Brandt. I'm originally from Argentina, and I moved to the States 20 years ago. And I was an artist uh, down there for, and I released a couple records until I won the, the label I was in dropped me and I said, okay, I'm gonna be a songwriter. I don't wanna be an artist anymore, that sucks. And uh, <laughs> so I moved here and, uh, and you know, I made a career as a songwriter and I, you know, I was asked up uh, Latina Writer of the Year several times and CSAC Latina Writer of the Year too. And then at 50 years old, I said to myself, uh, I wanna make a record and I made a record and I just won a Grammy for it, and I'm very happy. But I'm, but I'm, I'm mostly a songwriter, I have to admit it. 
Uh, hi, I'm Simon, and I'm um, Maria's co-founder and co-moderator today. And, and, and that's great. Simon also has a pretty stellar songwriting yeah. and artist career of her own. It's not about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, the first question that I think a lot of my clients ask is like, how do you decide which comes first for you when you when you're trying to juggle both things what's the process of determining how you spend your time how you prioritize your creative work how you deal with songs like which comes first is what do you have to choose or do you feel like you can hold them both um well I'll start yeah. um I think it, at least for me and maybe it's just uh beginning I think primarily as a with, with my own project as an artist, that definitely takes precedence. Um, but I think, you know, right now I've actually been enjoying working on songwriting with some of my same album collaborators, but for other people. So that's been sort of an interesting, like, confluence for me the last year has been, yeah, some of the same producers that I work on my stuff with, and we have that rhythm and rapport, introducing another artist into the mix and working on stuff for them. And that's actually been a pretty effective... Um, and a new way of approaching it for me. So definitely artist stuff comes first, um, writing second, but I've found that there's some intersection between those that's made it really easy and kind of fun. I think, uh, I think a lot of times the universe will tell you if you should be going towards your artistry or your writing because it's like you're seeing more movement in one area than the other. Um, but I think also sometimes it's a gift and a curse because uh, there's songs that you're like, you're crying about, oh, that's my song, and then, you know, somebody else wants to cut it, and you have to make that decision, but um, I think it just depends on each person, because if you can't sleep at night because you feel like a song is yours, then maybe, you know, that's something to look at, but there's so many people now becoming big artists because of their writing, so I feel like it's a, a way to break through, too, so just kind of like, you know, there's pros and cons. So how do you decide that? How do you decide if a song is yours? Like um, I had one particular song that <laughs> they uh, there was a DJ project that was coming out, and I really felt, it, I wrote that song just from the heart. I wrote it in like five minutes, and it was special to me, and they wanted to record it on a big artist. And so I cried about it, me and my girlfriend. We, I was, she's like, that's your song, that's your song. But I was like looking at it from a business perspective, and I was super torn, so I was like, um, I said, well, let her cut it, you know, let her record it. And she did, and they, they hated her voice on it. And she was huge. She had, like, I'm not going to say her name, but she was big. <laughs> and they loved my voice on it, so they ended up keeping me on it, and it ended up being my first platinum plaque. So, yeah. Um, so what do you think? Do you think, you, do you think as a writer, if you're trying to transition from writing, and maybe Becky, you can answer this because I know you've had that experience. Do you think it's important to achieve a certain level of success first as a writer before you transition to the artist thing or choose at the beginning? Like it's, I think a lot of people feel like they can get, as you said, they can get sucked into the momentum of the one side of it, but it's not necessarily their passion. And momentum isn't always, isn't where people's heart is, where their momentum is. So do you feel like, what's the point at which people have to choose, do you think? I don't know, I think sometimes maybe a song dictates that. Like, I, I find myself always being drawn to artist writers. I just, I like that point of view. Um, and I've, over the years managing, you know, I've managed some amazing people such as Mozilla right there and Julia. And, and I think just they're such a unique point of view and it's so personal. And I, I, I'll say with, with Julia, it definitely was, she was writing all these songs for other people. Um, I always knew she was an artist, but being an artist doesn't mean you actually have to be the person that gets up and actually sings a song. I mean, you can be an artist and be a writer that's behind the scenes. And one day there was just a song, and we were actually pitching it to other people, and if someone else had actually recorded it, and it was issues, and I was like, th she was starting to get the bug a bit, and she had a certain person at Republic that was like, you're an artist, you're an artist, you're an artist, and she was like, I don't know, and I was like, that's your song. It's issues, like, I know you, that's your diary. <laughs> you know, that, that, that is you, you know? <laughs> and anyone else, they could sing it. It's a great song. But it was the marriage of that with her, and it was so authentic. Um, I don't know. And I've always, I think over the years, I've signed, you know, whether I've signed a writer to management or to actual publishing or something, and they've always said, you know, people say I have to choose. And I'm like, you don't have to choose. I mean, I don't choose. I'm a mom, and I run a business. I don't choose either one of those. That's who I am. And that's who you are. 
and I think it makes you, you're more of a boss that way. And, yeah. and so, and it, yeah, so, yeah, I, don't, I think sometimes there's those moments that, that the choice kind of gets made for you, um, but I don't think you ever have to choose between the two. That's my personal opinion. Though. Is the process different, do you think, when you go in to write and you think, oh, I'm writing for so-and-so or this is for me? Is that a different process or do you bring the same material to the table every time? In my case, I, I, the record I made was had no, has nothing to do with what I, what pays my bills, which is writing hit songs for other people. So you wouldn't have written those specific songs no. had you been going into no, the studio? No, because in my particular case, I mean, I, I, I feel like I've done like the whole turnaround. I mean, I started as an artist. I got very disappointed. I decided to be behind the scenes and do my work as a songwriter, which I love, and I still do every day, almost every day. I write songs. But um, there was a, po a moment where I thought, okay, I want to make a record, and I want to I want to record all these songs that are so beautiful and have such a maybe such a strong message that no one's ever going to cut it. That's not going to be played on the radio. That's that's a reality. My record is not getting airplay because it's too jazzy or too world music or too complicated. And I'm okay with it because I know the drill. I've seen it. I know when, you know, when I went to see the, the labels with my record and I played two songs and they were looking at me like, are you out of your mind? Like, you know, <laughs> you're 50 years old and the songs are six minutes long. What, <laughs> what, what? There, you know what? What are you gonna do? I, I can't. I can't put this out. I mean, I can't. I mean, I mean, I'm, you're gonna drive me crazy. I can get you a promotion. I can play. Like, no. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. This. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, in my in my particular case, the music that I recorded for my project after doing the whole turn has nothing to do with what I do every day, which I love too, like writing, you know, the big hooks and stuff. It's, it's good, I know I have to deliver that in my, in my day job and I really enjoy it, I have nothing against it, but when it came for me to do the record I wanted to do at this time and age, I said, okay, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna record all these songs. I, I wrote new material and then I, I chose from those songs that were so beautiful that I knew for a fact no one was ever going to cut them. So there were some songs that you had written hypothetically to pitch to artists. Yeah, and then when I finished writing it with a bunch, you know, there's stuff there that I wrote with other artists or with other writers, and you finish the song, and we listen and said, wow, this is gorgeous, but, you know, this has, like, 20 chords. And, <laughs> you know, it's going to be rejected. They, they hear the second chord, and they're going to say, no, thank you very much. <laughs> so there, there, were certain so there are certain songs that I wrote that I, 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 when I heard them after I was done, I was like, okay, I'm not going to even try to pitch this. It's very hard unless there's a specific artist on a specific genre that's probably not going to sell a million copies. I mean, probably not for sure it's not going to sell a million copies. But I can pitch it to this specific artist, maybe. But I knew that those were songs that were not really going to be, you know, on the top ten of the Billboard charts. Right. But then, Becca, you said that Issues was like a journal entry for Julia. Is that always how she writes for other artists? Like, is it as though she's writing for herself? I think she always, she has a real unique point of view. And I, I think she, she, when she writes for herself, it's like stream of consciousness. I used to always be like, where are the lyrics to this? And she's like, I don't write them down. Like, she just gets on the mic and like spits it out. It's insane. Mm -hmm. um, and that's usually what they keep, you know? Um, but when she writes for other people, she would, if she were sitting here, she would say that she learned from Lindy Robbins, who's another client of ours, and she's unbelievable, like a songwriter who's, uh, you know, has had a career that's unbelievable, and she really mentored Julia, and I think one thing she taught her was, you know, taught, get to know that person, get to know where they're at. So I think when she writes with other people, it's a lot of asking them how they're feeling, what are they going through, but when she was writing with Selena, like for the Revival album, she was writing a lot of her personal experiences and Selena was hearing the songs and she was like, we must be going through the same thing because you are writing exactly what I'm feeling. And so that's how the relationship was built out of that. So I think it kind of, it depends. But I think when she's writing for other people, it's a lot of trying to connect with them and you write something that they're gonna connect with. Because it will be more personal to them then. 
Does anyone else have anything to share about process? Because I think it's a really interesting thing. Like, do you go into the studio thinking, I'm writing for this person today, or I'm just going to spill my guts on the page and see what happens? Yeah, I think for, for me, what I've been kind of discovering, and I sort of found it out on the reverse side, being in rooms for my artist stuff, is that I think a lot of artists have, and rightfully so, a lot of like protectiveness over what they're saying and what they're putting out in the world. And sometimes I think sessions can feel stifling, like maybe not, maybe the goals are a little bit different. And if the goal is to just like knock out a song in a day, maybe that doesn't line up with an artist's vision of like this, I have to live with this for the rest of my career. And this is like what I'm trying to say as a human being. So when I've been doing writing sessions, and my perspective is a little different because I haven't done much like for pitch, but um, I'm usually with the artist, and I kind of have been envisioning my role as like uh, just an advocate, just like someone to stand up for the artist in the room in a way and support them. So just like kind of what you're saying, Becca, like having a conversation, talking about what's what's going on, what are some ideas for the project and just goals in general and kind of starting the session being like, we don't need to achieve anything. If we just hang out and we talk and maybe you think of something interesting down the road from this conversation, that's a win in my book. Like I have no agenda. And I think that that's been, there's some type of relief I think that that offers or but I've it's noticed. A, it's a dramatically different role. Yes. Dramatically, so, being an advocate and being an artist are I think that you're also not only an advocate, you're a little bit of a yes. shrink. Yeah. 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 For sure. no, they, I, I try to have, whenever I have an artist, I try to have them for two or three days at least. Because the first day is just basically what you're saying, yeah. like what, what are you up to? Do you like girls? Do you like guys? Uh, are you alone? Where do you live? What food do you eat? And like, you know, you, you kind of get yeah. to know the person because like as Shelly Pikin says, it's like song sex. You're not just going to go for it like, hello. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> you need to, to learn a little bit about the personality so that you can get the best out of yourself to bring to this person and to make this interaction fruitful so that you write a song or you make beautiful music, honest music. If you don't know the, the other person, it's almost impossible. Yeah. That's why it's so hard to pitch songs because you pitch, so yeah, maybe I think she would like this and that, but it's not the same as having someone in the room. I think um, women are, I, oh, sorry. Nope. sorry. Um, I come in at it from a different angle. Um, generally, I come in prepared with an A&R direction because I notice like a lot of artists are, sometimes when you're brought in as a songwriter, they're lost, they're stuck, and they're lost. And they need someone to come in with some ideas of like, have you ever thought about doing this? Um, I've been in a lot of different bands and made a lot of different music. So my perspective is coming in like, have you ever thought about like doing a record like this or a lyrical direction like this? So I come kind of ready for that if I feel like they're totally dead because a lot of times they've been writing one billion songs <laughs> and they're dead. They're like emotionally dead. Mm -hmm. And they actually just want someone to be like, have you ever thought of this? Rather, uh, that gives, that can like s open the creative flow. And then that also builds trust in the relationship for me. But it's not always like that because some people know exactly like mm -hmm. what they want to say that day. And then you need to go with that because essentially it's their session when you're in with an artist session. <laughs> but yeah. I try to a &R it. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think, um, I think both sides work in especially like when it comes to urban, a lot of times you don't have to know too much sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the rap stuff is like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's both sides. I mean, because sometimes you don't have that time. Sometimes you only have one session and just got to get it done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, drink some alcohol. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> have you, I've had this with a few clients where there's sort of a, sometimes like a choice point comes where it's like, okay, do I spend my time doing this or do it? Do you guys have stories from your journeys of where you had to make decisions where you had to choose between the two things? Be like an artist or a yeah, it's like whether you were gonna go on the tour or do the session or go do the promo date or go get the opportunity for a, you know to collaborate with a bigger artist. Like I've seen artists, I've seen clients really struggle with those moments where they don't quite know how to navigate. Like okay, I could go and open for this band and then I'm gone for three months and I'm losing my momentum as a writer. And how do I? Have you had? Have you guys faced that? Yeah, I have. Have you? 
I I haven't faced it, but it might be because, like, I think my artist thing in in myself and for my team is just like the number one. Right, right, right. So that it's kind of like that's just this the state of affairs, and if if things fit in the schedule outside of touring and my record, then we're we're cool to try it. But it's it's kind of like there's never a question. Right. Um. I guess, yeah, I had a situation where I was doing Mark's campaign, my Femi Diamonds campaign, and Kylie Minogue's album. So she was needing me to be in LA. Um, and Mark needed me to be in London, and Femi Diamonds needed me to be in New York. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one time. And uh, that decision. At that time, it was artist-driven, so I made that decision. But I never, I feel like people like spaz in LA. They're like, decision, like if I miss one, it's like over, I'm dead. Like, <laughs> and it's like, nah, that's like, like you shouldn't make any decisions based out of fear with that. Like sessions come all, all the time, the opportunities come. And sometimes like your career is super defined by what you say no to. Yeah. It, 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 oftentimes it really is what you say no to is gonna define your career. So, you know, whatever. That's, can you stream. talk more about that? That's that's a good insight. I said no to a lot uh, of stuff that sometimes I'm like, no, oh, that was weird. Uh, <laughs> why did I do that? Um, but I'm glad I did. Uh, I said no to signing to a major label in 2010. I said no to all of them. Um, and I have literally the career I want. Um, I just exited a 13-year pub deal. I was in a pub deal for 13 years. I was if you know publishing is extraordinarily rare and um, <laughs> unicorn and uh, but I I uh, like a special slave unicorn but um, I'm out of that so I, I, it, it's taken a long time and I'm 40 but I, I literally I answer to no one and I make I'm from a farm <laughs> North Dakota so I I don't answer to anyone. I have the career I want and I make my own living. And I've made some decisions like to say no to like a Calvin Harris feature in 2011, but I said I don't want to be a feature artist. I'm an artist. And uh, so there's been a lot of those situations. And uh, also if you rewind, that was a very different era in the music industry. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I'd say that now. But, uh, <laughs> Probably jump right on that. Yeah, let's do it. Let's see what happens. Let's see where this can go. But I tried 20, no, I think it's 2010. 2010, I was like, mm, fuck that. So, but I, I ended up working with him and Rita later on. So, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. But uh, I, it, it can be a longer road, but, you know, I'm not making, every time I've made a decision out of fear, it has been horrible in this industry. Yeah. Horrible. I'm just gonna leave it on that. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going through this kind of funky situation right now where I'm, I'm leaving for Spain next Friday and my record has been distributed by Sony. It's been distributed by Sony and uh, I'm going to perform there as a guest in a, in a show of this massive uh, sp Spanish band, and the, the lead singer was featured in my record. So he invited me to perform there with them at this big venue. So I'm talking to the um, a &R of Sony, and he is, it's kind of funny, he's dealing with the PR department of Sony, and they're both in touch to juggle to see which days I have to do PR and which days I can sit with his artists mm. to write. It's a crazy situation. So depending on the schedule for PR, then I'll have the afternoon free and I can s sit in the room with so-and-so. And so the same guy is kind of putting this crazy plan together so I can do both. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I'm going to do it and the, the I'm going to have be jet lagged and I'm there for five days only. But somehow I have to, I'm not going to, in, in my case in particular, my, I think that the, the artist thing is great, but the songwriter is first. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna perform and I'm gonna sing and I'm gonna do my PR, but I'm, I'm really excited also about sitting with all these artists that I've never had a chance to write with 
and, and get in the room with them. So. I think, um, I think in the past my good heart has gotten me in business, you know, things that weren't always so good for me. <laughs> so like when I wrote the, um, the Diplo Iggy Azalea record, it was actually wasn't supposed to be Iggy Azalea, it was supposed to be me. And um, my buddy who I, we started the track with, he goes, Naz, let's feature you on it with FKI and whatever, whatever, whatever. And then, you know, a couple days later, he's like, Naz, um, he's like, do you wanna do you wanna stay on it? Or there's this girl named Iggy Azalea who's kind of blowing up, we could put her on it. And she's got like some momentum going on. I was like, oh, just give it to her. Because it'll probably be better for everyone. <laughs> like, so stupid. <laughs> so I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of moments like that. And like even when uh, when T I was helping Iggy, I was there in the trenches with them. And he wanted to sign me at the same time that he was signing her and pushing her. And all he was doing was, it was so easy for him because he was like, okay, we'll feature this person on her, da da da, da. And I was there through, like, through the whole process. And he wanted to sign me too. And I just was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I mean, there are those moments reflecting on like, you know, sometimes you're younger and silly. <laughs> and, like, those are like just, and I don't regret a lot of things, but there are some things that I probably should have said yes to. And you know, no, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Why did you say no to that opportunity? Which one? Um, at the time, I thought I would have to fight him creatively. I felt like he wanted me to be kind of more raunchy than what I really was. Um, but he did respect me enough to figure it out. And I think I should have thought about that. But like fast forward a year later, he runs up to me at Grammy week and he's like, Naz, I finally have balance. He's like, let's do it for real. He's like, I will pull for real and, and let's do it together. He's like, I got my weirdness balanced out. Like, Cause he knew I was kind of more alternative. So um, it just didn't work out because I was living in LA now and he was still in Atlanta and I wasn't in Atlanta anymore. So, but he was like, I'm ready now. Like, we, I balanced out my, my urban with my weirdness. So, I mean, at the time that was why I didn't want to do it, but yeah. <laughs> Have you felt like um, as you achieve success as one, as an artist or as a writer, that you had to fight certain stereotypes to be seen, to be taken seriously, say, as an artist, if you're seen as a successful writer or vice versa? Is it hard to transition within the industry from one to the other? Yeah. I think the hardest thing is I'm a producer. That's the hardest one. Is I write and produce. That that's really tough, actually. The producer, unfortunately, is tough. It's not. I think the 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 business likes like if you like burritos, you're gonna like pizza. You know, like <laughs> this person's <laughs> orbits so and so. You know, they like to reflect someone who's successful to sort of describe it to give opportunities. So if there's not a lot of women in those roles. It's like, you know, they're like. <laughs> I, what? Like, <laughs> so oftentimes I hear like me having to say, well, I can, you know, I have like flexibility in the studio, maybe something like a, I say it humbly, but like a John Hill or an Ariel Rush, you know, and I find that to be uh, difficult. How did you combat that? I just am like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I, I mean, honestly, I just, I'm like, okay, later, I'm going to go make music. You can <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, like, it's not, I, I mean, like, I don't, I think I realize, like, you can let the industry, like, and I love the industry, and I work on every level of it. I'm not, I'm not a negative person towards the industry, but I think as women, probably in any field, if you wait f for permission, you're never going to get it. So don't, don't wait for it to have the career you want. Just go do it. Because they're not going to give you permission. They're not going to give anyone permission because everyone's just like spazzing out all day. So. so you wanted to produce records. You just went ahead and produced records. Yeah, but I came up producing. I mean, okay. I just was doing it like on my own right. and stuff. So it wasn't a weird, like, I wasn't like, uh, I'm going to be a producer, you know. Right. <laughs> I was just, it was like a normal process for me from the 90s. <laughs> but the I, 80s. We had a conversation recently where you, because you got, you maybe I could talk for you, but yeah, yeah. you felt like you got put into the trap of being like the indie pop top liner and you were like, by the, and you, we had the greatest meeting because she was like, I'm not a fucking top liner, I'm a producer. <laughs> and I was like, this is the best meeting it's ever. Tammy top lining. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, do you have a left of center artist? <laughs> <laughs> Call Mandy. And I would just blow it. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, I was always like, is she like a little edgy? Like, I felt like I was like really typecasted. And I was like, 
I actually like, yeah, I can do this, but and I love it. I love making music every day, so I don't really, I don't have a big ego about it. I'm quite like Midwestern work ethic about it. Like, let's just go do it. Awesome, yeah. let's have fun. <laughs> but yeah, I, I kind of had to like just stop saying. I had to stop saying yes to those types of sessions because I was like, I don't. Yeah. Like, this isn't like what I'm actually good at doing. So th it's hard to figure that stuff out yeah. actually, because sometimes an opportunity is an opportunity, but it might not be the right opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is like, it's hard to traverse those waters, but just being confident in your skill set is really important. Yeah, someone said on the last panel, um, Lynn Earls, she said, some money costs too much to make. <laughs> and yeah. it was like, she just said the whole, everyone did the same thing, everyone was like, oh, I know what that means. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you can take the opportunity, and even if there's a reward, it like, and I've seen that with clients where the, Usually the songwriting career is, is going and they're, they're leaving something behind that they really were passionate about. And you can just see that there's just no fulfillment, even in the success, because they haven't had a chance to express yeah. this other yeah. part of them. And, I've, you know, and, and I get a lot of anecdotal stuff from writers say, oh, my publisher told me that I shouldn't be an artist. And there's a lot of pressure from the industry once someone's got momentum mm -hmm. and partners saying, no, no, just keep going, keep going, keep going. And I've always just tried to take, like, well, just do what's going to keep you alive, like, yeah. uh, creatively. Because if you, no one needs, just people need you to be alive creatively. And if you're not, then you're not going to write good songs for anybody. I think that in, in, in my, my case, I mean, I learned so much as a songwriter, you know, working for so many years and, like, so many, like, different, all kinds of different projects that, you know, that gave me the tools. So so I, I understand. I, I don't get depressed when someone says, no, no, you know, this record is not going to go anywhere. I don't care. Because I know the drill. I know what they want. I know what the A&Rs are used to get when they get on meetings. And I know what they're going to tell me because I, I studied the case for 20 years. So I don't expect, even though I have a name as a songwriter, I don't expect people to go crazy about my record. I did my record because I wanted, like what you just said, if I wouldn't have done that record, I would have like killed myself because I was like just constantly writing hit songs for other people and there was a part of me where you know I felt empty. I had to do it, so I did it. And I don't have uh, any kind of huge commercial expectations about it because I know the drill, because I learned it from working in the business for so long, so you know, it's okay. I think that if you if you come you start as an artist and you don't know anything and you're young and you have you know I have all these artists coming to my studio to to work to write with me and you know they're so happy because they signed their first deal and they're about to sign a publishing deal and and it's a 360 but it's great <laughs> and and they're so excited and I'm like okay yeah that's <laughs> wonderful you know and then, you know, some make it and then some don't. And it's, it's very hard because you get to see it. You have a different perspective because you've been behind the scenes for so long. So I don't have, you know, I don't, I'm not going to buy this castle or this princess dream because it's not like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the experience that gives you to be a, uh, that you achieve as a songwriter being behind the scenes is something, it's a great tool for us to understand when it comes the time to be an artist and you have to be on stage and you have to wait for, you know, am I gonna get promotion? Am I gonna get enough money for the video? Am I gonna get this and that? Well, maybe not, but I know that's the way it is, yeah. I think. So you think now, like, is it easier to start out as a writer and then transition if you, if you have the ability to do both or do you think it's better to kind of get your artist career going Maybe, Becca, you can speak to that because you've seen it both ways. Um, I don't know. I think it depends on the person. That sort of sounds like a cop-out answer, but um, I, I do think it's all about... It's about that moment. It's about a song. I mean, there's so many songs. I'll, I'll talk about Julia because that's the most recent one for me. It's like she wrote all these songs for all these other people. There was one that they talked about keeping her on, and the label felt like that was the moment to sort of like twist the arm and do some leverage of like, well, we'll keep you on this song if you sign to our label. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, that's not how we're doing this. And I think, wow, if she would have done that, it would have been a whole different trajectory than it was for her. And I think it, for her, it was, the, it was the right song. It was the right moment. 
And then you see people like, I'm going to talk about Mo, because I, <laughs> um, who started as an artist. But she's an artist writer. That's, that's who she is, you know? And she did the artist thing for a long time. And so she knows that. And I think it helps her, at least my perspective of you, Mo, <laughs> it helps her in the room, because she knows what these girls are going through and these guys are going through. And she realized, like, you know what? Like, this isn't what I want to do anymore. And I think for Julia, it was like, you know, I, I do want to do this. And I think she was finally being honest with herself a little bit. I think she, for whatever it is in every one of us that we tell ourselves we can't do something, whether it's you can't be an artist, you can't work in the music business, you can't have a kid and have a job, you know, or whatever it is, like, you have to start, like, what is true for you and what is that? And your path doesn't have to be someone else's path. Yeah, we got some questions. Lena? Um, I feel like I've been lying to myself for a while. Um, <laughs> the age of the industry, being an artist, um, I feel like I've worked with 16 to 19 old artists, and I'm just past, and then being past that age, I can't be an artist anymore. And I just told myself, it's just where I sit at. And I think <laughs> you need some life experience to be able to talk about it. <laughs> That's what I think. I don't care what a 14-year-old has to say. I don't connect with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, you know, and there's certain things, and maybe there's a different songs for that, you know. I mean, my husband manages a girl named Becky G, and, you know, she was signed at 14. She'd never had a boyfriend, you know, never kissed anyone. Not that that matters, but she, like, she was singing about things that she was a kid, you know? And, and for her, she didn't want to... She wasn't going to sing about sex and sexy stuff or whatever, because that wasn't, she hadn't lived that, you know? Um, I think sadly, I think even as women sometimes, we're like, oh, how old is that person? It's like, who fucking cares? You know what I mean? I'm 43 this year. Like, who cares, <laughs> you know? And I feel like I'm just getting started, and there's so much more that I want to do, and like, and age is, it doesn't matter. Now, when you're an artist, I mean, look at Claudia. like killing it, winning a Grammy, and, you know, and she's not 16, but she has things to say. 52. Like, yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we should be proud of how old we are. I don't want to be 25 again. No, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I also know. think, like, the business cares more. Like, I just finished yeah. my second album as MNDR, and I'm 40, and, and it... I, the business cares, but like the listener doesn't care. I just talked to my management about this. I was like, well, like they care. I mean, the business, like a, a label, because they have a box and it's nothing to get. That's just like looking at it without emotion or being pragmatic. But like, I make music for people who like music and like li listen, like I'm listening to it. I'm just a person listening to music and they don't care what you look like or how old you are. And that's always like, where you can kind of get like, you, you, I think if you keep that at the core of what you're doing, that really will direct you and sort of like turn down that noise of like, you have to be seven, oh, you're dead, it's 19, you know, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I agree. Mm -mm -mm. Most like, of it's, the, it's not real, well, it's just not real. Yeah. Things like a I think it's changed though. I think, and I was in the label system five years ago, it, ma it really mattered. It was an issue yeah. in a singing in an A&R meeting. That was a question. How old are Always. they? How old are they? How old are they? <laughs> But I think that's because the gatekeep. There's this particular kind of mentality at promo and at major labels and about what a pop star looks like mm. and what a pop star represents. And I think the the good news is the streaming environment has completely changed completely agree. your access to getting an audience and finding an audience. The downside of that is I don't think the audiences are as loyal to particular yeah. artists anymore. Totally so agree. it's really just about your song now. And you, c I mean, look, Fitz in the town. Fitz is what fifty. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, geez, like, like yeah. there's there's really no rules if you have a song that people connect with. The downside of that is those building that following is just harder and harder and harder. Yeah. And takes longer and longer and longer. So you may be, you know, by the time you've actually got a stable touring base or a stable fan base, you may be older because it just takes a long time to get that engagement. Yeah, but yeah. it's, you know, yeah, I think the change. field is completely different now. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about two chains. Yeah. <laughs> two chains didn't make it till he was like 40 yeah, something years old. He used to be right. called Titty Boy. He was 40 something years old when y'all learned about two chains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think most of the world just thinks I like it or I don't like it. We yes. we 
you know, I'm from the Midwest too. Yes. And it's like Midwest. you either keep the radio on or you turn it off <laughs> or yeah. turn the station, you know. <laughs> but I think we, in the business, it, there's all these analytics that we do and we think about all these things. And it's like most people don't think about that. It also depends what kind of music you're making yeah. as well. I think it just yeah. depends. And like Cloudy is a good example. Like, y you know, she is making something that is a you know, a age appropriate in a way, and it's like that. If you're trying to do really young rhythmic pop, then you'd probably need to be 16 if you want to be on Radio Disney. But like, if you're making music that's more sophisticated, and also I, I think the economic imperative, like what part of your career supports your life, and how free are you to make what you want to make <coughs> as an artist versus. I have to make something that's going to make me money. I think this, it's just very different. But I, I think the streaming platform, nobody cares. Like this, I've never been asked that by any programmer or curator at Spotify. How old are they? They're just like, do I like yes. the song? Are people going to keep listening to the song? Yes. Share who's still, or you know, we could just go on and on, or the, any of the rock bands, you know, the Eagles, the Stones, all these groups that have these careers where in their 60s and 70s they're going out here and making hundreds of millions of dollars on one tour, but they took a lifetime to build that, and so you have to hold on to what it is you're trying to accomplish and don't feel like the clock is working against you, see it as working for you, you know. I'm just gonna keep going for questions. That's the reboot magic, just like that. <laughs> Yeah. 
I was just going to yeah. say song trust. Okay. Um, hi. Why don't also maybe introduce yourselves. Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Sonny Vitolius. How you doing? Hi, Sonny. Hi. hi. Somebody said about ageism, um, it really comes from life experience as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also want to know um, how would you, what advice would you give to somebody that's about to get signed but has no manager? Yeah. Get a manager. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, what I'm saying is, yeah. help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many, are there any managers in the room? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I, I will agree. I mean, I'm, I am on the executive side. It is overwhelming how much business goes into even, like, just getting, I manage a mixer. It's just like a mix. The amount of paperwork a mix generates. Yeah. The, if you charge $500 and, like, the amount of, people, lawyers, man, like people involved in getting an A&R admin, Uniport, it's like, oh, yeah. it's so intense and it's not, unfortunately, going to get any easier. The bureau bureaucracy of the music business <coughs> is designed, I think, sometimes to not pay you. That's yeah. the goal of everybody's yes. businesses. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you just sort of have to go into it acknowledging that, that that is how they're designed is to release as little money as possible most of the time. And um, yeah, there are services, there actually is a lot of technology coming up now where it's getting a little bit easier song trust i don't i haven't dealt with that that's my, i think i'm song trust for yeah. my clients but people really like that service yeah. can, I, can i add something to that as well yeah um, I, I know that you're talking about the transition between writer and artist but me me not having a manager for so long mm -hmm. i actually started to uh uh really uh study the craft of a and r mm -hmm. so so what what advice would you give somebody that what advice would you give them? Uh, I, would, I would give them get a lawyer, for one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't sign anything on the threshold. 100%. Okay, and um, I just say read the fine print. Always. Always. Very good. Always. Yeah. yeah. That's great advice. Yeah, thank you. Mo? Um, Um, 
yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the exciting thing is it's artist driven and I find that uh, artists, uh, we're gonna talk about age, so. So um, <laughs> it's gonna be like, I, I notice like very young artists, um, I like 18 to 22, don't think it's weird to work with a female producer. They're not just like, whoa, this is crazy. They're just like, <laughs> yeah, let's, what's the problem here? So, um, and usually the roles are defined before the session. So, uh, but I'm never shy because I have a, a background, a harm, like piano, whatever. Like if the producer's a beat producer, a lot of time you're like saving them. You just like can't be shy about it and don't be afraid to just be like, hey, why don't I throw some chords in there? Because a lot of producers don't know any chords, like basic harmonic foundation. And if you have that background, that is like, a huge, you gotta like catch every edge in a room, you know? And so play to your strengths. And if young artists are reaching out to work or you're reaching out to them, like go, run, because they're really driving the change, which is exciting. Yeah, I think that's a really good point you're making too about setting up expectations beforehand, because I mean, kind of fundamentally, none of us know what to believe about anything. So if we're, if we're told something, we will probably believe it. Um, so I think if, if a session is, the, if the premise is like, hey, this person is a producer and a writer, this person is a top liner, this person is an artist, whatever the roles are, that's kind of how people enter that situation. So I do think it is sort of the purview of the manager or the publisher, whoever is piecing together the session, to kind of establish some of those roles out the gate. Because if... I mean, I think for all of us, if we walked into a room and we're told, like, you're going to be producing this record, we'd think you were going to produce the record. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and we, would, we would sort of all be aware of that. Um, so I, I do think part of it is establishing those roles in the same way that, like, you know, I think often sort of we're socialized men, like, say what they want as though it already exists, you know, and so I think sometimes we should try to do that. Yeah, I was gonna say like there are times when you just gotta have balls. Like honestly, like I've been in so many sessions with rappers who are like have had top ten, you know, legendary rapper guys, and I'm the only girl in the room. And I've always found my balance with like when to actually show <laughs> that I like have the skills. Like I was working with Twister, and um, I was sitting there, and and all he has like three writers with him that he brought from Chicago, and they're like. They like trying to figure out how to write it, and I had already came up with it as soon as the beat came on, and I'm just like, but I'm waiting a little bit, <laughs> because there is a balance. Because if I immediately jump up like yo, da, da, you know, then they might be like, what is this girl doing? So I, I took a minute, I gave them 15 minutes, and they still didn't have it, and I was like, I have something, and I went in the booth, and they were like, what the, <laughs> you know, this girl just made that, you know, and so I think you have to find your balance in it, because when you're in a room with kings, you got to be a king, you know, like you can't, you can't be. Uh, you know, you gotta like. <laughs> so, yeah. Or a queen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like to call girls king, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna name my daughter king. So. Yes. <laughs> questions. The questions are better than anything I've got written down here, so we'll keep going. Yeah. And I just wanna give props to the men who are here yes. because yes. it's growing every Thank time. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, question specifically for yourself, Kate, though, but I'd love to sort of open it up. Specifically choosing collaborators, collaborators, keeping you around, what do you do when specifically you have an artist who's in the I want to see this group? I think yourself that you have somewhat more like an obscure avenue above a lot of people. So <laughs> what do you do in terms of finding the right people, keeping you around to make sure this is what we're all Um, well, so yeah, speaking to that, the, the two uh, main production collaborators that I had on my last record are the same two people on this record. So it's kind of the last, you know, three and a half, four years have been sort of this, this small brain trust of the same people. I think one of the main things I look for is just reliability. Like if somebody is reliable, I will probably be involved with them in some way. And um, maybe that's like a... A low, a low threshold, but um, I think part of it is, and I found this, and I don't know if other artists can relate, but 
<laughs> is, Sandra wants to speak. She's is is involving. Okay, so sorry, this is part of a bigger thing where I think sometimes what happens in a songwriting room, and this is just talking to friends who are writers, you do all this stuff and then the artist goes and you have no idea what's happening, you don't know when the song's coming out, you're not involved in the creative and you feel kind of like divorced from that process even though you wrote the song. Um, and so what I've really tried to do is bring especially those, those two people into the project. Like even with artwork, like sending it to them, being like, what do you think of this? Is this like... Do you like this? Is this interesting to you? Um, and, and just feeling like we're part of this, this effort together because I think there's like a loneliness. And I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. This is just what I've kind of gleaned from talking to people. There's a loneliness mm -hmm. about being a songwriter sometimes or a producer. You do these things in the room and then it's just like, it's gone. Um, and it's out there in the world. So I think it's been about, at least for me, just involving them in the project as, as friends and one of them started playing with me and my band, um, which was really, I mean, for me, very gratifying, kind of, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's a lot about finding the right match for whatever project you're doing. If it's like, you know, for my own project, I picked these this two people, these two producers that are, that they love the same music that I love, and I knew they were the right people to work on my project, but I don't work with them in all of the other projects. If I get an artist that's urban, I know that I would like to bring in the room a producer that's more focused into that genre. And if I'm working with, uh, I don't know, Messia Periné from Colombia, who's a very alternative band, I'm going to either write with them on my own or bring someone that's very familiar with that type of music so that the combination works. For every genre, I think it's a different animal. So I, I, I really think I, I have learned a lot from a lot of people that I brought in the room because they they were they belong to completely different genres depending on the artist I was going to work with and that's very nurturing I think because you get to experience different perspectives from different genres in any language and it's it's really a learning experience great question thank you hi I'm Lena hi Lena um, Well, as someone who runs a publishing company, I think <laughs> <laughs> publishing companies are awesome. Um, no, look, I understand what he's saying, which is, you know, there's a range of human beings at work in the music business, and there are some shitty, shitty deals that fuck people's careers up. And then there are some incredible people in the music business who, you know, Beck is one of them, that I think have really been instrumental in the success of the people that are signed to them. So I think it's it's really about due diligence. It's about people have reputations. There are a lot of people out there that will tell you if you go and ask people who are signed to those companies, did they help you? Do they help you? Are they involved? Some people, yeah, hopefully we get good press. I know Becca always got great press. Um, some people don't get good press. And it's pretty easy to find out what people's reputations are from their DM people on Instagram. Like You can find out who's signed to what publishing companies. I think. What I will say 
is I really do look for people to know what they want and what they're trying to achieve. I can't invent a career for somebody. So you have to really know, because there's so many opportunities that people who come, I'll do anything. That's kind of a red flag for me. When I'm scary. like, I don't, I don't want Very you to scary. do everything. I want you to know who you are as a creative person, what's going to keep you alive, what's going to keep you inspired, what's going to make me inspired, because I don't need more bad music. And, <laughs> you know, that relationship can come very early in someone's career. Sometimes they need, you need to do 10,000 hours to figure out who you are and what... I mean, as our conversation was inspiring, because you were like, I'm not this, I'm this. I'm like, great, I can work with that. Like, I know what to do. And I think that that's, as an executive... Sometimes we can let people down in, in that play where you're like, I just don't, I don't know where, what the next step is. So as long as you know what your next step is, go find the people that can help you take that step. You also, need to find champions. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, but yeah. also, champions. do you have a manager? Are you getting good sessions? Do you like the rooms you're in? And can you afford to not sign a publishing deal right. if one is offered? Yeah. Those are the questions There's I usually ask people when they're asking yeah. me, should I sign a pub deal? And there's no magic answer for anyone mm -hmm. I think I think it's finding some it's finding your champion early and that may mean you know hustling first of all it's your career always and you should out hustle every person on your team always mm -hmm. you you are the CEO of your business and you're bringing on other people who are joining you in that and there's moments where you know, we all hold each other up when the other person's like having a tough time or whatever, but it's, I, I always tell every single person that I work with at least, or that I've signed to publishing, it's like, this is your career. So don't sign here and think that I'm gonna just invent it for you because we're not gonna like each other. You know, like we're gonna, it's gonna be contentious because we're not on the same page. Um, do you wait till you have a big hit? If you can, yeah. you know, but like the, the relationship that you have shouldn't be defined by a dollar amount either. You know what I mean? Like I've had a lot of, I've worked with a lot of people who have signed big giant deals that never talked to their publisher and felt like, oh my gosh, I mean, you could have got a better bank loan. You know, really, you're giving away a large portion of what you own, so go get that money from somewhere else if you have to. Um, and Or I've been with people that have signed really small deals, but their team was so instrumental in building with them mm -hmm. that th that's the key. It's not, I mean, People are always like, oh, so-and-so got that deal for that amount of money. And I was like, who cares? <laughs> it's all your money. Anyway. Literally, your like, money. Yeah. okay, who cares? You know? And, by the way, half the time, those big deals, that's nice for a second. Then people are so scared because they spent so much money on you that they doubt every single step. <laughs> because it's like, oh, my God, this has to, I have to have a hit immediately because I have to recoup this amount of money. It's like... I don't know. I'd always say, like, if you believe that that's all you're worth, okay, you know, like, it doesn't matter, you know. Not Hopefully so, you're going to yeah. recoup it, and we're all going to be making money together, and we're going to feel good about that creative, you know, relationship. I mean, our t Pulse, our two biggest writers, were Star and Bonnie McKee, both were day one signings. I mean, Star had, like, 5% of a Kid Inc. sort of mini urban hit. But she was working at a shipping facility and she needed to not be working at a shipping facility mm -hmm. so she could actually have a career. And that was, you know, her advance. And then to her credit, she, we gave her advance and she gave her two weeks notice and worked her two weeks notice at the shipping facility. And it was like that, that point in her career, she needed that resource to be able to live and do the thing that she was supposed to do. So I think it, it's so individual. It's so, rel as, as Simon said, like, what are your, what are your choices? What are you, where are you at? Um, you know, managers can be really helpful as well in those early days. But, um, I mean, I, I believe in us as a company, so I believe in publishing as a, as a vehicle for people. But I agree with Becca. It's so much about you knowing where you're headed and having your own sort of compass pointed. Yeah. What's your name? My name is Dora. Hey, Dora. Yeah. As a, as a record, 
suggest it has an impact on it. But you gotta do all of that. Yeah. Every single thing you just described as an artist, when you put a record out, you need to plan that part of your business. So if this is the single, then you need to have a creative checklist <coughs> and a video. I need to know who am I marketing to, who's my target demographic for this, et cetera, et cetera. And they break it down for you for you, like with Google ads and things like that, where you can go straight to who you want to discover and the people you want to discover you. But you can't just put the record up and expect that the record's going to sell itself. Right. You know, record companies <laughs> don't do that either. Or when they do, they don't do it on the act that they are counting on making money from. You know, you have to have a plan. So you have to take responsibility if you're going to be an independent artist over all of that. And I think you have to just tell yourself, um, just like you work hard to figure out how to make the best music for yourself, you have to take some time and do some of the homework to find out how to do the things that will um, advance the marketing and the promotion side of your music. Your social media following is a huge part of it because they can tell other people you know, your, what, how you do your advertising, how you split it up, you know, where your, where's your audience? So you have to understand a lot about yourself. And as they were saying up here on the panel, knowing who you are is probably the most important thing because that means you know who would buy my music. You take your, you, you know, just be very honest. This is the kind of artist I am, who would buy my music? And I think the smartest way to achieve that is figure out not to, to say that you are some other artist who is famous, but if you think that the people who like that person will like your music, that gives you a, um, a, a barrier and a barometer at least of where to start in terms of how to identify who your fan base is. Um. And then follow that person and see how their stuff is being marketed. And that can give you so many clues of what you should be doing. You know, That's you a don't good have to reinvent the wheel. That's a good question, Sophie. How do you just how do you know who you are as an artist? What's that process? R me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're on the panel. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I I actually built to answer you and you, Dora. Uh, so I just finished my second album, and it's like <laughs> cheerfully super critical on. Uh, Social media. It's called Hell to Be You, Baby. And it's um, so right there, really playing into the tools of today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know that uh, as an artist, people listen to MNDR for, I've always written about politics. I've always written sort of a, po I was in punk and noise bands. So my takes, I don't write, a, like I'm not, I, even as a songwriter, I, I really, like if you're looking for a love song, like, <laughs> Keep it moving, because I'm not very good at that. So, um, but so I I know that, and I know like I'm a dance artist, but I literally made a playbook. I have a playbook, and I have like marketing strategies and like having me super creative about like basically I don't like influencer uh, culture. I think it's like literally dumb. I think it's made everyone <laughs> dumb, yes. and I just want to like barf on it, and then just like can we just stop? doing this. This is really stupid. Thank you. So, <laughs> and like, and I also looked at myself and said, well, I guess I have two, because I work with artists all the time. I, I do everything at once because I have a lot of energy. And um, <laughs> it's either, well, I could like, you know, like, and pop my pussy on Instagram, which no, I, I'm not mad at that, but I'm saying that gets you followers. So what are your choice? Okay, I'm not going to do that, and I don't judge anyone who does do that. That's dope, and fucking do whatever you want. Like, I'm cool. Like, do you. If, do you. But that's not my project, and I'm 40, and no one wants to see that. Like, I don't want to <laughs> see that. No one wants to fucking see that. I never did that. Like, no one. So I, like, the way... So then you're like, how am I going to like grab followers when I'm just not like fucking, you know, like dying on the internet, like spazzing out, you know, I, it's like really tough, but I was, I like figured it out the other day and literally I've spent like two years thinking about it because I knew what this album was about. And I was like, I was like, how do I like, I, I can't ignore social media is like the biggest part of being an artist. Like making the album, it took me seven years to finish this. And it's like, that I thought was hard, and that was really hard. Like, 
like and and then I'm like oh, I gotta market this. What am I gonna do? And I like it's about hating social media. <laughs> like <laughs> I told my managers that they were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> so, but <clears throat> if you're creative, you can figure out a way to do it. And I like solved it. But you have to be engaged in that platform, but you need to do it honest to you. And honestly, for my MNDR, I'm like, the suggestions I've had have been like, well, just like, like Instagram stream yourself like doing stuff during the day. And I'm like, girl, I'm like 40. Like I'm going to the gym. I'm like, get, like going to Trader Joe's, like just here, you know, like, <laughs> like I don't do anything. <laughs> Like, I'm not like, what up, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> like, I don't do that. So, what is going to be my voice? <laughs> but I, like, figured it out. So, it's like, honestly, you got to, like, find that. You have to. And you can't ignore it. And we used to be big babies. Artists used to be big babies because we'd just be like, we got it on Fader. Now I have a record deal. Remember those days? <laughs> Faders behind it. I have a record deal. <laughs> like, literally, that was my story. <laughs> You're like, cool. It's not that way anymore. So it's actually the most important part. Well, but don't I feel like you have to be at McDonald's like filming yourself. Like really frustrating because that that is always what the music industry is like. Just I'm like, you, like you're at Starbucks. Like just do that. And it's like, I, no. <laughs> Christine, sorry. Well, I just want to interject. And add on to that, that I, I personally, and I think this kind of gets to, Maria, what you're talking about with streaming in terms of people's loyalty to artists. Um, I do still really believe that the live show is, yes. is like the number one thing if mm -hmm. you want to have a, a long artist career. It is the reason I have a career, mm -hmm. for sure. And like, you know, I was signed super early to RCA, whatever, in a, a version of what, the fader, <laughs> right, okay. Um, <laughs> I got dropped, I put out a record independently, I started a label with my manager, who's also my best friend, and I will really advocate for good managers, like don't, don't sell yourself short on that. Um, and then really when we kind of had our own thing running, we were able to sign a deal that was really kind of productive for me um, at Interscope, and I really, really credit every positive thing that has happened in my music career to a show. I can actually pretty much trace specific shows that people attended, whether it's like a radio PD that now is playing my song seven years later, who came and saw me in San Francisco, which is a real example. Um, so I do, I do fundamentally believe that that is, that kind of, mm -hmm. uh, is the difference between like the passive listener and the active listener, because you do have to show up and pay money and like go somewhere. Um, and I do think that's really important if you wanna have like a, an artist career. Yeah, and I, I always say to clients, like, the art form doesn't end in the studio. Mm -hmm. Like, the art form is social media. Like, and, and to your point, like, digital marketing agencies will tell you, the whole point of being an artist is you're supposed to do something new. And artists mm -hmm. that have done great social, are usually doing something new or saying something new or using it in a new way. So you just treat it as an art form and not as an obligation. It's like another way to express yourself. It's another way to be creative. The same with a live show. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that's, for us, the number one thing now because it is so ephemeral and people are moving on. So the metabolism for music is so fast. There's so much music coming out. Even if you have a song that's number two on New Music Friday, it's gone next week. Right. It's like gone next week. So what are you going to do week three, week four? And the live show is everything, I think. And I think that's really the kind of distinct... When, I, when a writer comes to me and says, you know, I want to be an artist, that's really the dividing line. It's like, can you perform can you perform on stage can you captivate an audience can yeah. you bring bring something new to the conversation and that that's the definition to me the, the business is there and you have to traverse that and like they're there to help but like as an artist your connection and the people that drive your career and have the most power are, are your fans always always and like if you get too caught up in the other noise then you're forgetting about them, and that's the most important person as an artist in your career, really, your fan base. One last question. Uh, Thanks. I just want to just interject in what you're saying. I think it's important that you have all the social media, and there's, there's seven lanes. So you're amazing live, and like that captures. And then you came up with a tool where in two years it was playing like I fix you, and the artist Bones did 70 music videos under two minutes because they knew, or if everyone sees him. And so 
someone else is a super really smart quitter is going to be a great outlet for you. But I think it is important just as you're finding like what's your main user group, it's like, well, what is my special connection to my audience? If you're a fashion designer, go make a brand connection with fashion, and that, that could be your break for, for you know, next. Instagram is your way to do that. There's seven lanes that you can't go 100% all the way in. So I do think it's important mm -hmm. to find like, where is my- What's your medium, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. where, where is my strength and what's the strongest way to draw them to connect with me to what I do? Mm -hmm. And often that's, I think, I mean, I'm not an artist, but I think it's hard sometimes for artists to know that for themselves. So, like, having your trusted council of people who'll tell you, you know what, you're great. YouTube is your thing. We've got to focus on YouTube because you're a great dancer and we need to show that. Or, you know, y the way you connect with the fans on Instagram and Twitter and the, your, your the voice as a, as a writer. Is, so just finding out that what that is and having your few trusted people who really know you and believe in you that can kind of give you that feedback is really important. Um, I think we have to wrap. Maybe one more question, then we have to wrap. Hey, this is Shani from Last Songwriter Artist. Hey, Nikki. I just wanted to ask, um, what do you guys think about like the songwriter artists specifically, like they're trying to get to pitch the labels and then they're trying to pitch the publishers? Like, is there a certain time in your career? Like, because I have both of those things, so I'm just not sure if I should go the publishing route first or the label route. Anything? Can you speak on that a little bit? What do you guys think? I think that the 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 label route. Unfortunately, even though we don't care about the age thing, uh, there's something there that we can't deny. That, you know, it's not the same, they don't look at you the same, the, the label people if you're 20 than if you're 35, or if you're 28. So, like if you go, you start at 28, they will go like, oh, maybe time's up too soon, maybe we should sign a 19 year old so we can develop her, and then when she hits it, it's 23 and she's not that old even though it sounds ridiculous, but that's the way it is. So, I mean, uh, I think that the, the label thing with your project as an artist, you should try to, you know, get it into the right hands as soon as you can. The, the, the songwriting thing, I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm 52 and I still do it because I enjoy it. The day I don't enjoy it anymore, I'm not gonna write one more song. Mm. But I think that the, the, the behind the scenes, the songwriting career is it's more timeless or it gives you a more like a, a wider window, right? You think so? Yeah, for sure. Is anyone dreaming of being a writer or does everyone dream of being an artist first? I wonder if that, that little germination always starts as an artist and then transitions. I know I'm getting back to what we were, where we started. Yeah, but no, it's good. You're bringing it back. It's good. Uh, I wonder if, if, does that always how it begins and then you transition? Or, or when you were, Claudia, when you were writing songs in your bedroom as a young mm -hmm. child, were you thinking, I can't wait to write songs for other people? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I, yeah, I, was, I was writing songs in my bedroom when I was like 10 years old with the shitty guitar my parents gave me. And, and I was thinking, oh, I, I want to sing and I want to be on stage and I want to do a tour and all these things. And then when I signed my first deal and they told me, oh, but your hair has to be like this and you have to sing this kind of music and this is not, you know, and I started looking at, at it from a different perspective. I thought, oh, my God, I really, I really want to write songs for other people. Yeah, because I just wanted to be David Bowie all day long. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but I, I mean, are. I started with the artist thing, and I switched. then I switched to songwriter, and now I'm back. But I, 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 as I said before, I think I learned the hard way, so I know what I'm dealing with now. I, I guess sorry. weirdly had the exact opposite, and I always think it sounds smug when I say this, so I don't really share it very often. But I had put some demos I wrote for other artists on MySpace, and I was blogging about studio gear because my interests were to be producer only so and cool. those yeah and it and then it, like expo like and I remember saying to uh my collaborator at the time I was like no I was 30 I was like I was laughing because I was like no one wants to see like a 30 year old pop like I was like this is and he was like no you should you should just try it and I kind of I, I think this is like one good piece of unsolicited advice but the opportunity was there and I just took it and I didn't really care if I succeeded or failed at it. And I think sometimes when I see people like trying to, no, I'm a this, I'm only a this, I'm only a writer, I'm only a this, like they strangle their opportunities to death and they close down a lot. Mm -hmm. So I took that opportunity. I really 
wasn't interested in like hair and makeup and weird outfits and I like did that thing and that was really weird and um <laughs> but it led to like where I'm at now and I'm like super glad I took that opportunity because I was really prepared to just be like I don't want to do that this is stupid like why would I do that like so that was another tale that's great of that journey yay. so yay So thank you guys, um, and you know, please tell all your friends and bring friends next time. Yeah,